Hi, I would like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. I'm Ben Zelmer, President of Lutheran Student Fellowship. Lutheran Student Fellowship is a new ministry organization at the college dedicated to teaching others about the Lutheran tradition of the Christian faith. Grove City students, we invite you to join us for our weekly study of the Lutheran Confessions at 6.30 p.m. in Ketrek on Sunday nights. We are honored to have Dr. Carl Truman join us as a speaker this evening. Dr. Truman is a professor in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies here at Grove City College. He holds degrees from Cambridge University and the University of Aberdeen. He's a contributing editor at First Things Magazine and a co-host of the Mortification of Spin podcast. He's also authored over a dozen books, including The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Between Wittenberg, Geneva, Lutheran and Reformed Theology and Conversation, and Luther on the Christian Life, Cross and Freedom. As you probably know, he possesses an impressive wealth of knowledge regarding Reformation history and its key figures. He's been featured in several documentaries on Martin Luther, such as Luther, The Life and Legacy of the German Reformer. Dr. Truman, himself a Calvinist, possesses an incredible respect for Luther and Lutheranism more broadly. <laughs> when developing ideas for Lutheran Student Fellowship's first public event, I concluded there would be no better way to inaugurate this organization's creation than to host a lecture from Dr. Truman. After the lecture concludes, I hope you'll remain with us for a brief Q&A session. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Truman. Well, thank you very much for those kind words of welcome and for the, the honor of uh, being the inaugural speaker at the, the Lutheran Student Fellowship. I think it's tremendous uh, that this has started on campus and I'm delighted to be uh, involved at this early stage. And I was reminded just before uh, I came up by Isaac Willow that in 2015, a lecture I gave on Luther changed his life. Uh, I was speaking at a youth camp and I'd been asked to do some, you know, the life of Luther as a, as a youth camp thing. And I started off by mentioning that Luther had originally uh, wanted to be a lawyer. And I asked, uh, is there any of you young people want to be lawyers? And Isaac put up his hand, foolishly being honest. And uh, I pointed to him and I said, shame on you. That is a disgraceful profession. Luther repented. And became a theologian, and Isaac tells me that that was the moment that uh, God spoke to him and uh, uh, started to sanctify his heart. So, well, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. I, I, uh, as I was outed as a Calvinist uh, at the start there, I should perhaps explain uh, my own interest and love for Luther. I first encountered Luther uh, in my final year of undergraduate. Uh, not in a formal classroom, but I picked up a copy of Roland Bainton's little book, Here I Stand. And I remember lying on my bed in my, my dorm one afternoon and could not put it down. It still remains for me, I think, one of the most page-turning and exciting biographies of Luther available. It's a little dated, but I heartily recommend it to you. And one of the things that I later learned about Bainton that I think was critical to his biography of Luther was this. Uh, Bainton was a Unitarian and a conscientious objector in the Second World War. Now you might say, why would that make Bainton such a good biographer of Luther? I think it's this. Roland Bainton knew what it was like to be a despised outsider in his day and in his generation. And certainly Luther, for the early to mid part of his reforming career, would have had precisely that experience. So I want to start by saying I think Luther is a fascinating figure, and he's fascinating in part because he's an outsider. I want to talk this evening, though, about why I have found him theologically useful over the years. Again, to go back to my university days, I remember going to what we would call in the UK a Christian Union meeting, like an IVF meeting on campus. In, I think, my gain, my final year of undergraduate studies, and the speaker made a comment to the effect that it is impossible to learn everything there is to know about theology. And he said, my advice to you is pick two or three theologians and spend your lives reading everything you can by them. And Luther was one of those theologians that I chose. 
And as we were leaving the house tonight, my wife Katrina said to me, you know, you haven't spoken on Luther for a long time. By the way, it is very refreshing to be giving a public lecture on Martin Luther ra rather than on why women should not become men and vice versa. Uh, but I'm very encouraged that, uh, that, to be able to be on this uh, particular topic. But my wife said to me, uh, you know, you've not lectured on Luther publicly for a long time. Do you think you can remember enough about him? And I said, I've not lectured on him for a long time. I said, but I think I can honestly say, I think about him every day. He's one of those theologians who is a constant companion and dialogue partner over the decades of my Christian life. So just before we get started, just one of my favorite Luther woodcuts. Uh, one thing I love about Reformation woodcuts, of course, you've got to remember in the Reformation, literacy rates probably 5%-ish in Europe. So even though the Reformation is a movement of the printed word, the message really travels by the spoken word and by pictures. It's kind of ironic in some ways, particularly in the Reformed Reformation, that uh, the Reformed Reformation travels by pictures, and yet its message is that pictures are fundamentally misleading in a lot of ways. But this is a classic Reformation woodcut, and you notice Luther here is a set of bagpipes. And look at who's playing him. The devil is playing him. You don't need to be able to read Martin Luther to get the message. What Luther says, he's really just a front for the devil. So one of my favorite Luther woodcuts. Let's move on. Uh, reasons to love Luther or why I love Luther and you should love him too. Uh, so a couple of things I haven't listed here. Uh, he's a tremendously human reformer. One of the Lutheran pastors reminded me before we began this evening that I end my book on Luther on the Christian life by saying, you know, if I'm trapped on a desert island and I got to choose a theologian to hang out with, Calvin doesn't really cut it. Too cold, too bitter. Martin Luther, I would not get a word in edgeways, but I would be laughing every day. Martin Luther, tremendous sense of humor, tremendously human. And that's something I find compellingly attractive about him. By the way, just as an aside, of course, there are very unattractive uh, dimensions of Luther, uh, particularly Luther on the Jews. I'm not intending to address that during my talk this evening, but you should feel no embarrassment in asking me about that during the Q&A. Uh, it's difficult, be difficult to give a quick answer to that, but I can give you the bare bones of how I myself would address the issue of Luther's uh, rather despicable uh, writings on the Jews. Very happy to address that question. But when we're looking at substantive theology, I think I would say four areas, four areas where I find Luther to be very helpful. Three of them, I think, are probably pretty commonplace in discussions of Luther. He's a theologian of the word. He's a theologian of the cross. And if you're not familiar with that term, we'll explain. I'll explain in a few minutes time precisely what Luther means by theologian of the cross. He's also a theologian of worship. You know, we often tend to think of the Reformation as a kind of doctrinal movement. But of course, in many ways, the Reformation was a pastoral movement. Luther gets involved in Reformation out of pastoral concerns. And Reformation theology is inseparable from the kinds of changes to worship of which we all benefit, even Catholic friends now benefit from Luther's shifts, uh, the, the shifts Luther brings about on worship. So he's a theologian of worship. And I also want to just conclude this evening by saying I think he's also say, a theologian of the demonic. And that's something that's been preoccupying me just recently uh, for reasons that we'll come to a little bit later. So that's what I want to do. And I, I don't want to give a standard biography of Luther in this. I'm going to weave some biographical details in. But what I want to do is zero in on these four main heads. It doesn't cover Luther by any stretch of the imagination. But I want to zero in on these four heads in order to try to bring out some of the basic structures and basic emphases of his thought. So first of all, then, let's go to theologian of the word. Luther has a, a fundamental confidence in the power of the preached word. And for many years, I taught at a seminary. And for a while, I was dean and vice president at the seminary. And one of the things I wrestled with there was, you know, how do we teach men to preach well? Can they be taught to preach well if they don't have a natural gift? 
I never cracked the code, but I became convinced that part of the solution to preaching is that people who preach need to have a theology of preaching so they know what they're doing. So that when I'm preaching, for example, I know that I'm not doing something that's quite the same as what I'm doing now. There is a theology that attaches to preaching that does not attach to lecturing or seminars or something like that or round, uh, round table Bible studies, all of which can be good things and all of which can be excellent for learning theology. But the proclaimed word has a theological significance that those other things don't have. I love this statement from Luther, partly because it touches on beer drinking. I have a whole, I have a small collection of Luther memorabilia at home, most of which focuses on beer drinking in some way or other. I've got a beautiful Diet of Worms beer growler, for example, I found online. I bought it uh, at, at a price that my wife would not have approved of. So I did what all good husbands did. I hid it in my office uh, because my wife never visits me in my office. Then one day she visited me in my office and there it was sitting on the desk and I had to explain it. But by that point, it was too late to return it. So I'm still able to enjoy it even today. This comes from a, a sermon that Luther preaches in 1522. Now, 1522 is an interesting year. Diet of Worms is 1521. That's when Luther faces the combined might of church and empire at the Diet of Worms and refuses to recant his teaching. It's where he makes his famous here I stand speech. After the Diet of Worms, Luther is kidnapped by his own men. As he leaves Worms, Frederick the Wise, who's the prince of electoral Saxony, where Luther is a, a, a resident and a professor, Frederick the Wise has the equivalent of his special forces kidnap Luther and whisk him away to the Wartburg Castle which is a castle high on a hill over the town of Eisenach. Uh, Eisenach, incidentally, if you ever go to Germany, well worth visiting because you not only get Luther up on the hill, you get Johann Sebastian Bach down in the town as well. The, the Bach uh, birthplace is in the town there. Luther then spends a considerable part of the rest of 1521 uh, in uh, the Wartburg Castle, where he starts to translate the Bible into Germany. Meanwhile, the leadership of the Reformation in Wittenberg passes to his colleague, Dean of the Faculty Andreas Bodenstein von Karschnat, and a group of younger, more radical men who want to push the Reformation in a kind of iconoclastic way. They want to start celebrating the Mass, wearing ordinary peasant clothes. They want to start smashing windows. And Luther returns to uh, Wittenberg incognito late in 1521 to see what's going on. Then he returns again sort of permanently in early 1522. Now in the sort of Luther legend, most people tend to think that Luther is at his most vulnerable at the Diet of Worms. There he is, surrounded by these hostile church and imperial authorities. In actual fact, I think he's most vulnerable in early 1522 when he goes back to Wittenberg. Because if he can't bring peace back to the streets of Wittenberg and stop the iconoclastic riots, Frederick the Wise is going to pull the plug on the Reformation. And it all comes down to Luther at this point. He can't rely on anybody else. So I think the Wittenberg Reformation hangs by a thread in early 1522. And Luther preaches a remarkable series of sermons in and through which he's able to sort of recapture the initiative and recapture the leadership of the Wittenberg German Reformation. And in the midst of one of these sermons, they're called the Invocawit Sermons, Luther says this, What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, that's vintage Luther, uh, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? Lutheran Student Fellowship, you call yourself by an evil name according to your boss here. Uh, I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And this is the, the sentence I love. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip, that's Melanchthon, his sort of right-hand man, professor of Greek at Wittenberg, and Amsdorf, another of his colleagues, Philip van Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. 
I did nothing. The word did everything. There we have Luther ascribing the cause, the success of the Reformation simply to the word of God. It's the word of God. Now that rests upon a theology. By the way, I, this is one of my favorite Luther paintings. Here you have Luther preaching and you'll notice his left hand is on the, uh, the Bible and his right hand is pointing to Christ crucified. It's a beautiful, uh, dramatic, artistic representation of his philosophy of what preaching is. You move from the text of Scripture to point people to Christ crucified. But I'm particularly touched by these two characters here. You'll notice that this young woman, her scarf covers her chin. And she has a little baby on her lap. Well, that's Magdalena Luther and little Elizabeth Luther. Elizabeth Luther died shortly after childbirth. Magdalena died when she was older. Uh, and Luther has a very moving account of her death in his arms. And that uh, covering of the chin was the artist's way of indicating that she was dead. They were dead by the time the painting was supposed to be set. But I've always thought, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that when the artist painted the Luther family at worship, he included the dead children as well? It's rather beautiful. The whole family is there, even though two of them have been separated by the great cold gulf of death. So that's Luther describing the power of preaching. Here is the theology that he bases it on. This is drawn from his commentary on Genesis. Listen to what he says here. Who could conceive of the possibility of bringing forth from the water a being which clearly could not continue to exist in water? But God speaks a mere word, and immediately the birds are brought forth from the water. If the word is spoken, all things are possible, so that out of the water are made either fish or birds. He's talking about the days of creation here. Therefore, any bird whatever and any fish whatever, these are nothing but nouns in the divine rule of language. Through this rule of language, those things that are impossible become very easy while those things that are clearly opposite become very much alike and vice versa. Now, there's a whole wealth of late medieval philosophy lying behind Luther's thinking about language here that need not detain us. The point to grasp is this. Luther thinks language is creative. When the minister proclaims the word, things change. Language is not descriptive for Luther. It is constitutive, constructive, creative. And we all have a kind of intuition of that. You know, when you think we all know there are certain words, there are certain epithets that we shouldn't apply to other people. Why? Because they hurt those people. If you use certain racial epithets, you're not describing somebody. You're doing something to them. You're doing something, I wouldn't say creative, but you're doing something destructive in that sense. The word is bringing a state of affairs into being. Well, Luther sees that. He sees that power of language underlying preaching. When the minister proclaims the word, the minister, we might say, is confronting the congregation and transforming the congregation. You can see why I think that, you know, for a minister to have a grasp of a theology of preaching should transform his preaching. That it becomes not simply like a Bible study, not simply a Bible talk, it becomes something powerful and creative. In 2009, I was in Australia uh, teaching for a few weeks, and I was asked to, to speak, to preach at a, an Anglican church. Sorry, Don, at an Anglican church. I'm going to damn the Anglicans here in my, in my anecdotes. <laughs> I was asked to speak at a, an Anglican church uh, on the Sunday. And as I was getting ready to go up and preach, suddenly the, the, the minister, the vicar, the priest said, OK, we'll take a break there and we can all go and grab some coffee uh, and we'll come back in five minutes and Truman can explain the Bible to us. And I remember thinking, how many things are wrong in that sentence? It's hard, but I'm English, so I'm kind of Am I polite or hypocritical? I leave it to you to decide. But I decided to say nothing about it and just play along. But I remember thinking afterwards, I hope I didn't just explain the Bible. Because preaching is not explaining the Bible. It's never less than explaining the Bible. But it's actually a word that comes from God that should transform those who sit under its power. 
And Luther gets that. Luther sees, if you like, a close analogy between human speech, particularly speech coming from the pulpit, and divine speech in creation. Maybe some of you here are thinking of going into the ministry. Don't go into the ministry thinking you're going to explain the Bible. Go into the ministry thinking you're going to proclaim the creative and redemptive word of God. And here, Luther describes the power of that word. The efficacy. Christ is full of grace and life and salvation. The soul is full of sin, death and damnation. Now let faith come between them and sin's death and damnation will be Christ's, while grace, life and salvation will be the soul's. For if Christ is a bridegroom, he must take upon himself the things which are his bride's and bestow upon her the things that are his. If he gives her his body and very self, how shall he not give her all that is his? And if he takes the body of the bride, how shall he not take all that is hers? See, I'm going to pick on Isaac for the second time this evening. I'm going to be, have the honor of marrying Isaac and his fiance uh, in September. And at that wedding, I will use words, not to describe what's going on, but to bring into reality a new state of being. When I proclaim Isaac and his bride to be man and wife, I am not looking at them and thinking, oh, wow, they've suddenly become man and wife. I need to tell everybody by the very words I use, I'm bringing that relationship into existence. Powerful and creative. That's what Luther's getting at here. When the word is proclaimed, when Christ comes and meets with his people, as he's grasped by faith, so those people are transformed at that very moment. So the first thing I love about Luther, he's a theologian of the word, the power of the word. Secondly, Luther's a theologian of the cross. You'll sometimes hear it said that Luther is not a systematic theologian. And I think in a narrow sense, that's correct. You know, you'll search long and hard in Luther's very, very voluminous works for anything uh, approximating to what we would now consider to be a systematic theology, or even really a systematic theological treatment of a single theological uh, commonplace. But sometimes when people say Luther's not a systematic theologian, they're being a bit mischievous. And they're implying that he's not a consistent theologian. Now, I think any man who writes as much as Luther did can't be expected to be consistent every sentence on every page. There are going to be blips creep in there. But I would say 99% of Luther is very consistent, it seems to me, certainly from about 1516 onwards. And one of the things that binds Luther together is an emphasis upon the theology of the cross. It's there in 1518. It's there before it, actually. And it's there in the later Luther as well. So what exactly is the theology of the cross? Well, here are four very famous theses, points for debate, drawn from a discussion that takes place in the city of Heidelberg in April 1518. If you know your Luther story, you know 95 Theses, he publishes them October the 31st, 1570. And that becomes the, uh, the lightning rod or the flashpoint for the Reformation. The irony is, if you've ever read the 95 Theses, it's, it's not a particularly easy track to understand. You need to have a certain amount of medieval theology behind you. And Luther had said more radical things before in September of that year. And indeed was to go on and say far more radical things in April of the following year. There's also a rather amusing sermon from, I think it's about April 1517, where Luther is preaching on indulgences, and the first half of the sermon he's promoting them. And then halfway through he sort of says, hang on a minute, none of this makes sense. And he switches, and in the second half of the sermon he preaches against indulgences. Uh, it's interesting, uh, I'm not aware of many sermons where the minister changes his mind halfway through and goes in a completely different direction. But I think that April 1518 is when Luther's more mature theology or maturing theology really comes to public attention. It's a gathering of the Augustinian order, the friars, the brotherhood, which Luther belonged to. It was not gathered to deal with the Luther problem. It's just gathering to deal with routine business. And as often happens today at chapter meetings or a presbytery meeting, uh, somebody presents a theological paper. 
for interesting discussion. And Luther prepares a series of theses that are actually presented uh, by a colleague of his, Leonard Beyer, for discussion. And it's here that he starts to lay out his really radical Reformation theology. Look at these theses. The first one, that person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. What's Luther saying here? He's saying, a person doesn't deserve to become a theologian, called a theologian, <coughs> we might put it this way, who tries to read off the surface of things, <coughs> the way the world is, the way the world God himself is. That person doesn't deserve, he says, to be called a theologian. Instead, he says, <coughs> he deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. <coughs> and then he goes on and says, the theology of glory, though I think probably it's more correctly translated as a theologian of glory, a theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theology of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. What Luther's calling for here is the placing of the cross at the center of Christian theology. <clears throat> now, many of you here, good Christians, you know, the cross, of course, it's, it's central for us. And we tend to think of the cross often in terms of atonement. If you're a conservative Protestant, you probably tend to think of it in terms of what we call penal substitutionary atonement. That Christ takes our sins and suffers the penal uh, penalty of the sins that we've committed against God. But Luther wants to do something richer, I think, than that. For Luther, the cross is not simply an action whereby God atones for sin. It's also where God reveals how he acts towards his people. Think about the, the four reactions to Christ on the cross in the Gospel of Luke. Religious leaders, soldiers, first thief, second thief. The first three all play on the same kind of theme. If you're the king of the Jews, if you're the Messiah, come on down. Have some sympathy for the uh, uh, first thief. You know, he's dying in agony. He's not going to be thinking as clearly as he might. The second thief, though, says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think of the contrast between those reactions. The first set of reactions are... For you to demonstrate that you're the Messiah and the King of the Jews, you have to escape from death. The second thief sees that Jesus comes into his kingdom through death. We might say, who would have expected that? We might say, that's the exact opposite of what you might expect the Messiah or the King to do. Well, that's Luther's point in the theology of the cross. The cross is the contradiction of human expectations of how God should act. The cross, if you like, stands as a judgment over all human, all too human thoughts of who God is and how he should act. Think about justification. We might routinely think of justification instinctively as, well, I've got to make myself righteous for God to be favorable towards me. Well, Luther would say, that's a theologian of glory thinking. Theologian of the cross understands that, no, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's kind of encapsulated in the last thesis, the 28th thesis of the theological theses at Heidelberg. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. I won't embarrass. No, I will embarrass Isaac again. Isaac, I'm assuming that uh, when you saw your fiance, you saw something intrinsically beautiful in her that drew your love outwards. She wasn't repel. You, you didn't look at her and say, that, she's disgusting. You did not think that. I hope not. You were amazed to see what she thought. <laughs> well, that's why I used you and not her as the example. Uh, I was trying to be very tactful here. Human love responds to that which is already lovely. And Luther would say the big error you could make with God's love is assuming that it works with the same logic and dynamic as human love. But notice he says this about God's love. The love of God does not find but creates that which is lovely to it. 
You are not lovely in God's sight because you were first lovely. God looked down from heaven and thought, man, that guy there or that girl there, they're kind of lovely. I think I will love them. Luther says, no. God looks down on human beings and he sees none that are lovely. And then he declares that he loves them. That's the logic of the cross. So Luther's theology of the cross, I've only touched the surface there. There's an excellent book by an old German theologian, Walter von Leuwenich, uh, Luther's Theology of the Cross. I reread it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you're wrestling with issues of revelation or of suffering, I strongly recommend Walter von Leuwenich's uh, Luther's Theology of the Cross. We also see this. Luther in 1539 will make the cross a mark of the church. You know, if you're reformed, you have two, maybe three marks of the church. Luther has seven. Two sacraments are two separate ones, so we might say really, it's really six. But the seventh mark is this. It's the cross. Seventh, the holy Christian people are externally recognized by the holy possession of the sacred cross. And here he's clearly playing a polemical game. Because uh, you go to, say you go to Rome, you can find churches in Rome, my wife and I have found them, where there are pieces of the original cross. And that was rife in Luther's day. And he's clearly playing with the idea of, you know, you say you're the church because you've got pieces of the real cross. Well, you're right in a sense that the true church possesses the cross. But then he redefines what the cross is. They must endure every misfortune and persecution, all kinds of trials and evil from the devil, the world and the flesh, as the Lord's Prayer indicates, by inward sadness, timidity, fear, outward poverty, contempt, illness, weakness, in order to become like their head Christ. And the only reason they must suffer is that they steadfastly adhere to Christ and God's word, enduring this for the sake of Christ. Luther, if you like, is saying outward contradiction and suffering, that's going to be a mark of the church. Now, I don't necessarily think he's saying here that if you, don't, if you belong to a church that isn't outwardly contradicting and suffering at this moment, it's not a true church. But I think what he's saying is that as a church, as a whole, and as individual Christians, a horizon of expectation should make a great place for suffering. Contradiction and suffering are core to the Christian experience. And that will be true for all of us at some point. You may be the wealthiest person and the healthiest person at the moment, but you will die one day. Your body will break down and you will suffer. And for Luther, the theology of the cross is not just an abstract methodological idea that allows you to redefine theological words. It redefines the Christian life as well, the expectations of the Christian life. And I think particularly in the era in which we live now, where the church, certainly in the West, is getting smaller and will be more contradicted, this is an important lesson to remember. I think, one, it, will, it shelters us from despair, and two, it also helps us to resist the temptation of trying to play with worldly power. Because Luther would say, that's not the way of the church. The way of the church is the way of the cross, not the way of worldly power. So, second thing about Luther, uh, theology of the cross. More quickly, another great Luther picture here showing uh, Lutheran worship in action. Uh, you have a preacher and you have the sacraments being administered. Uh, Luther uh, has a central place, not only for the word, but also for the sacrament. And that can be very confusing often to evangelical people uh, for whom, you know, the Lord's Supper, sometimes it's like a bit of an add-on extra at the end of a service. Always struck, I was telling somebody today, when you look at a great evangelical writer like John Stott's book on basic Christianity, I think he has one page on the Lord's Supper or something. It's quite staggering when you compare that to the uh, long-standing Christian tradition that goes back uh, many centuries. My wife and I have just started doing the, the Bible in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz. It's a great podcast. John 6 today, we had 15 minutes on the Mass. Full, I have to say, of historical errors, by the way. But um, uh, it's very interesting that you know, the, he did make one very good point, and that is sacraments have been very important historically for Christians. And Luther's very sensitive to that. Uh, and, of course, it's the thing that splits Protestantism. Luther breaks with Zwingli and the Reformed on whether the whole Christ, human and divine, is present, as Luther, later Lutheran theology will say, in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine. 
some years ago, I spoke at Concordia Seminary in uh, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I was sitting next to uh, Ron Ziegler, their systematician, who's part, I think, at that point of the LCMS's ecumenical committee. And I asked him, you know, how's ecumenism with the reform going? And he laughed and he said, we don't even bother with that. He said, I spend all our time talking to Catholics, because at least they have the real presence. Uh, I felt suitably put in my place at that point, but I, I do love uh, Dr. Ziegler and, and his work. But sacrament very important. And again, I think Luther lands some good punches on the sacraments. You, know, you can be reformed, you can be Zwinglian if you wish, but you have to grapple with Luther's ideas. Uh, I was saying to a Lutheran friend, John Pless, the other week, if I could just get to the communication of attributes, I could be a Lutheran. And he's commented, yeah, but that's the only thing that matters. And he said, yeah, I understand that. That's a great gulf that, but that I can't cross. Second thing that Luther does, the whole people sing. Luther was a prolific hymn writer. And he, more than anybody else, I think is responsible for corporate hymn singing. That's why I said even Catholic friends have benefited from the Reformation because we now have corporate singing in many Catholic churches. It's always struck me as interesting. This is pure speculation on my part. But, you know, human beings are the only creatures made in the image of God. And there are two things of which I'm aware that only human beings can do or appreciate. We are the only creatures who can speak. And I, speak, I don't care how many chimpanzees you train to order Diet Cokes, pushing bits of plastic around on a board. They're not speaking. They're not speaking. We're the only creatures who can speak, communicate by speech, change our worlds by speech. And we're the only creatures who can produce and appreciate music. I believe we're the only creatures with the physiology that allows us really to hear music as music and it strikes me as interesting isn't it that luther at the reformation what does he do he places the word and music back at the heart of christian worship corporate christian worship pure speculation on my part but maybe that's part of the restoring of the image of god in christian worship that's going on there he also puts the liturgy into the vernacular uh, I always, was always struck by the fact he calls for a vernacular liturgy in 1520. He doesn't implement one fully until 1525. He waits five years for two reasons. One, he does not want to disturb the people more than they're already being disturbed. The Reformation is causing chaos in their lives. And whereas we as Protestants think everybody must have been just gasping for the Reformation to arrive, I have a strong suspicion that you know, if you've ever been in a church where they try to change the Bible translation from an old one to a newer one, you'll know that people don't like change. Luther was sensitive to that. But the other reason was, got to get the music right. German music for a German mass. I used to say when I was taught at seminary, telling young guys going out to the ministry, when you go to a church, don't change anything for five years, unless it's heresy. If there's heresy involved, you've got to change it there and then. Everything else can wait. You've got to build goodwill and you've got to bring your people along with you without hurting them or doing them damage. Luther, of all people, hot-headed Luther, great example of that. Great example of that. And he writes catechisms. Uh, the Great Visitation of 1528. Luther wants to know what, uh, what's going on in the Lutheran territories. How's the Reformation progressing? Uh, and oh, I can run with it from here. Uh, he sends out uh, visitors into all the parishes, two churchmen, two politicians, two representatives, representatives of the civil magistrates. Go out into the parishes and come back and say... You know, they bring a pretty well, they bring a pretty bleak picture of what's going on in the parishes. And Luther's comments, some of the effect of, we gave them the gospel and the people live like irrational swine. When I was a pastor, I would long for the days when you could get away with calling your people irrational swine. These days, you would be fired on the spot and they would get somebody more therapeutic in, I'm sure, straight away. But as a result, Luther realizes that people need more we would say it sounds awful that people need more than preaching people need dots connected for them you can expand the word and that's great and powerful and transformative but it's also good to give people the big picture and he produces these two beautiful documents the small catechism which is really very childlike and the 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 the, the large catechism which is more like homilies much more elaborate document. The one, I think, is really to help ministers 
You know, when you think about it, the Reformation sweeping through so fast, yesterday's Catholic priest is becoming today's Lutheran minister. And they don't really know what they're talking about, so you've got to provide them with materials to help them. But the small catechism is the one that fascinates me. Think about this. Luther was the first man who wrote a question and answer catechism in the history of the church after first being a father. Luther's writings are full of it. He's fascinated by children. He's a bit of a big kid himself in many ways, for good and for ill. But when you read Luther's catechism, if ever you've, maybe you've walked through the woods with a, a younger sibling, and their questions are always very straightforward. You know, what is that? Oh, it's a bird. Well, you know what the next question is? Well, what is a bird? Or what does a bird do? And they're led in these very, very simple ways. Luther's catechism has exactly that kind of quality to it. I'm convinced it's because he was first and foremost a parent before he became a catechist. And then finally, a theologian of the demonic. Why do I mention this? Well, Luther, between God and devil, plays to an image that Luther uses in bondage of the will, of the idea of human beings as a kind of horse. And there's this conflict going on uh, between the two of them. Can you bring up the full screen? If you just click it on the top, I think. Uh, that's it. Uh, between God and the devil as to who will ride. Fascinates me. And it's come to intrigue me more and more over recent years because it seems that I don't know if our age is exceptional or whether I've just become more and more aware of stuff that goes on. But we're all aware of things that happen in this world that are so irrationally evil. It's hard to explain them, even simply on the basis of, I might say, routine human sinfulness. And that's left me as a sort of somewhat rationalist Calvinist, I suppose, in a bit of a dilemma. What do I do with the demonic? without ending up going down some sort of wild and wonderful speculative route where there's a, a demon hiding under every cushion on my settee. I'm mean, struck that Luther, Luther seems to have a sensitivity to the, the closeness and the proximity of personal malignant evil, and yet does not use it as a means of excusing his sin or the sin of other people. First quotation here is from Luther. You who imagine the human will as something standing on neutral ground. He's having a wacky Erasmus here. And left to its own devices. Find it easy to imagine also that there can be an endeavor of the will in either direction. Because you think of both God and the devil as a long way off. And as if they were only observers of that mutable free will. <clears throat> For you do not believe that they are movers and inciters of a servile will. And engaged in most bitter conflict with one another. And then just over recent months, I've been reading a lot of, I, I read him in the 90s and <coughs> sort of forgot about him, and I've come back to him. The modern, uh, or relatively modern, Lutheran theologian, Helmut Thielicke, who's a fascinating character because he was teaching and preaching in Nazi Germany. He rubbed shoulders with many Christians and many Christian teachers who supported or got involved in terrible evil. The problem of evil was not an abstract philosophical concept for Thielicke. It was there when he looked out of the window. Tilica says this, I'm never the object of demonic action in the exculpating sense that it is merely applied to me from the outside. Rather, I'm always subject to. When the diabolos employs the zeitgeist or the anonymity of the crowd in German, das Mann, to lead me astray, I can never plead this as an excuse. What I like about this is both Luther and Tilica building on Luther are allowing for the New Testament teaching that there are evil, I wouldn't say even evil forces in this world, because we're not dealing impersonally here, we're dealing with personal evil that are very close, and acknowledging the existence and the reality and the power of those forces does not require us to engage either on the one hand in crazy speculation, or on the other hand to get out from under our own responsibility. We are tempted by these forces, but it is us that gives in to them and must therefore take responsibility. Okay, last slide. I thought I would close my section with Luther's uh, evening prayer. Let us pray. My Heavenly Father, I thank you through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, that you have protected me by your grace. Forgive, I pray, all my sins and the evil I have done. Protect me by your grace tonight. <clears throat> 
I put myself in your care, body and soul, and all that I have. Let your holy angels be with me, so that the evil enemy will not gain power over me. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Thank you for listening so patiently. I'll take questions now for a few minutes if you have any you'd like to ask. You raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll just hand you the mic. Um, okay, Vicar's got a question. Thank you for your um, very in insightful and thorough um, appreciation of Luther. Um, I want to ask, to what degree do you think it's fair to understand Luther as theologian of the word and Luther as theologian of the demonic as being in some way um, two sides of the same coin almost, in that in both of these cases he's seeing spiritual forces as... Well, <laughs> I just used the word force when you... Yeah, I used it as well, <laughs> having said I shouldn't use it. So. Um, spiritual forces and or beings as being um, imminently present yeah. in, in, in this world. Um, to, to me, that seems very closely related in that he's not yeah. only a theologian of the de demonic, but also of the angelic and the celestial and... Um, God's work through his, his word and through his angels. I think absolutely that's the case. And I think it connects to the fact, when I taught Luther for, for many years in Reformation, I always sort of taught him as the last man of the Middle Ages. Because I think his view of the world is, to use sort of Charles Taylor kind of a, a language, it's an enchanted view of the world. I would say to students, you know, you think you, you think you think like Luther because, hey, you love the Bible and you believe in justification by grace through faith. But... If you have never walked through the woods late at night and been worried that old Nick is going to jump out from behind a tree and grab hold of you, you have never experienced, intuited the world as Luther has intuited the world. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, historically, I would, I would explain that by saying, you know, he's really a medieval man. He's born just a few weeks before Zwingli, but they're born on different planets culturally in many ways. Uh, and then, yes, the, the power of the word it's a battle that Luther's engaged in. The preaching of the word is the weapon in the battle. The sacraments are a weapon in the battle. So when you know, the devil comes uh, to tempt Luther, and this blows the mind of, of evangelical students, when you tell them, when they, as you know, when the devil comes to tempt Luther, he doesn't say, I signed a decision card on such and such a day. You cannot have me. He says, I've been baptized. Baptism is a weapon as well. So I think you're absolutely correct. Any more? Oh, we have one up here. Is there a part of Luther's life or story that you um, personally really connect with or find really, um, like just something you keep circling back to? Is there like a, a, a moment or a trait about him or like something that he said um, or even a situation that he found himself in that you personally relate to? Yeah. I think... I think the, the, the moment that most grips my imagination is his return to Wittenberg in 1522. When he goes back to Wittenberg and, and the alliance that has held together and sort of kept him safe up until that point is, is rapidly fracturing and its ultimate collapse will be... Um, the, the Peasants' War, three, year, three years down the line. But I think it's at that moment when you know, he really does stand as one man alone. And I find that tremendously admirable, that ultimately he was prepared to take on everybody at tremendous personal risk because of absolute conviction. Now, the downside of that is that personality type means that when he gets the wrong end of the stick, it's a disaster. And you know, this is when I when I taught Luther on the Jews. One of the things I would say is, you can't have the Luther of 1521, 1522 without the risk of the Luther of 1543, and on the Jews and their lies, because the same personality type does both: the bull-headed man who's just going to say what he thinks is true, and nobody can stop him. You know, you're not going to... His, his right-hand man, Philip Melanchthon, the gentle professor of Greek, Melanchthon's never going to bring the Reformation about. 
because he's too balanced a human being in many ways. You know, Luther has that personality that allows him to smash things. And when he's smashing the right things, it's really good. When he's smashing the wrong things, it's really bad. But in terms of moments, I think 1522, the return to Wittenberg, and here he is. And he takes them on. My, my favorite Luther anecdote, though, the other one is, in late 1521, two students are making their way to Wittenberg to, to study. And they stop at a pub. And they notice in the corner uh, a, if I can do it, they notice in the corner an aggressive-looking bearded knight. I forgot to, an aggressive-looking bearded knight reading the Psalms in Hebrew which I gather was an unusual thing for aggressive knights to do, even in Germany in 1521. Uh, uh, and they go over and, uh, and, and this, this knight explains to them how Christ is present in the Psalms. And at the end of the evening, they go their separate ways. And then some months later, they arrive for their first class in Wittenberg uh, with the great Martin Luther. And who should be standing at the front of the class? But Martin Luther going to lecture to them. And they had uh, inadvertently had dinner with the great man without knowing who he was. That's a great, that's my favorite Luther story. Uh, uh, there's another one as well, where he's in, in less light, but perhaps speaks to good marriages. Luther's sitting at table and he makes um, a, a, a ferociously insulting comment about one of the, uh, the Anabaptist leaders, whose name eludes me at this point. Uh, and his wife rebukes him. She tells him off. She said, that is a disgraceful way to refer to another minister of the gospel. You are not to speak about gospel ministers like that. And he backs down. Um, she was quite a woman. Uh, uh. Thank you. I knew I needed to study the Reformation, but apparently I really do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Isaac down there. Yeah, no. <laughs> Isaac's moving in for payback. Excellent talk. It's always, it's always interesting to hear about Luther's theology of the demonic, I will say. Studying Luther's theology of the demonic has been really helped me and prepared me to be your employee. Um, so I've quite, I want to ask you about Luther and the Jews, right? What do you do with Luther's statements on the Jews? It, is it as simple as another time, another place, we move on, or...? How do no, you grapple with that? No, I think uh, Luther on the Jews, the, the, the real... William J. Shira's great work, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which is one of the best journalistic, even an eyewitness account of the rise and fall of Hitler. Early in that work, he makes the case that sort of Luther brings about the Holocaust. You, know, you find Luther here, and this bears fruition in the, in the mid-20th century in the Holocaust. And years and years ago, a Jewish friend asked me to write an article on Luther and the Jews for a journal he edited. And I actually refused at the time on the grounds I said, I just don't think I've done enough history and, and thought enough about how to do history to answer that question. Because the great temptation is you either go in to exonerate Luther or you go in to damn him. And it struck me that both were problematic. So I would say this on, on the Luther front. First of all, You've got to set him in context. Luther does not invent anti-Judaism in the Middle Ages. Uh, in fact, if you look at his writing of 1543 on the Jews and their lies, it's full of cliches. The blood libel, the idea that Jews are kidnapping little Christian babies and crucifying them and using the blood for this, that, and the other. Uh, it's full of cliches. It's, it's a remarkably pungent treatise because he's a great writer, but it's a pretty cliched piece of work. Uh, secondly, I think you have to realize that Luther is part of a, a very ignominious and shameful anti-Jewish trajectory in, in, in Western Christian thought. And if you visit the Wittenberg Church today, you still see what they call the Judensau up uh, over the door, which is uh, uh, it's a pig suckling Jewish children with a rabbi with his uh, fist shoved up the pig's uh, backside. Uh, and it was a way of saying Jews not welcome. Uh, I think we need to understand, though, that Judaism more uh, anti-Semitism morphs. Well, anti-Judaism morphs into anti-Semitism in the 19th century. 
Although I think now most would accept that the 16th and 17th century, we, we start to see, for example, in Shakespeare's Othello, some of what would later become racial stereotypes. The groundwork is being laid. I don't think there is any strong sense of race in the way that we have a sense of race today. So, for example, in Luther's day, if a Jew converted to Christianity, the problem's more or less solved. That They may still be mocked because of certain physiological features, but by and large, the problem solved. The Nuremberg Laws in Nazi Germany make it very clear that if you convert to Christianity, it makes no difference because it's a problem of blood. It's not a problem of religion. So anti-Judaism morphs at some point in the 19th century to this kind of cod, you know, um, quasi-scientific, baloney, racial theory. So all of that is to say, to get from Luther to Hitler, there are a number of steps you have to go through. The other thing about Luther is, you know, what drives this? And, and I would say to students, you know, to me, the problem of Luther and the Jews is not the treatise of 1543. I expect Christian men in 1543 in Western Europe to be writing treaties that are anti-Jewish. That's not unusual. And I would always say, you know, when I was teaching historical method, you know, it's not the expected that you have to explain, it's the unexpected. Well, let's go back to 1523, where Luther writes a major treatise on the Jews that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Now, this treatise is interesting because this is the odd man out. This is a remarkably pro-Jewish treatise where Luther is really advocating, you know, be kind to your Jewish neighbors. Uh, treat them with respect. That's weird in the early 16th century. So the question becomes, what happens between 1523 and 1543 to make the big change? I think what happens is this, and you, it, it, you can track it in various places in Luther's thinking on, on a number of issues. I think Luther expects the Reformation to carry all before it in 15, early 1520s. He expects the Reformation to triumph. Think of the confidence of that, uh, the Invocarwitz sermon. I just preached the word, went to sleep, or had a glass of beer, and the word did it all. This is a man who thinks if we just preach the word, the world will fall into Christ's hands. 1528, the visitation. We gave them the word and they lived like irrational swine. When you hit the early 1540s, Luther's ill. He's starting to die, we might say. He's, it takes a long time to die, but his, his life is crumbling away. And Jesus hasn't returned. Reformation is now in disarray on some fronts, is suffering setbacks. I think he becomes bitter and disillusioned, and he looks for people to blame. And he finds, I think there are four groups, if you look in the later Luther writings, there are four groups that he goes after who've stopped the Reformation triumphing. You have the Turks who are pressing in from the east. You have the Schwerma. You have the Anabaptists. Uh, you have uh, the Catholics. And you have the Jews. And of the four, in some ways, we might say the Jews are as guilty or more guilty than any of the others, as far as Luther is concerned, because they have Moses and the prophets. They should know, and they don't. So I think he becomes very angry and bitter about what he perceives to be the failure of the Reformation, and he blames the Jews. None of that is to excuse what he says, but it is to say, how do I go about it? Do I blame him for the Holocaust? No. Do I get him off the hook? No. I think he is a significant and influential representative uh, of a virulent strain of anti Jewish thinking in West Greece, which will morph into anti-Semitism in the 19th century. You know, when I was doing, uh, when I wrote my little book, Histories and Fallacies, I, I thought I'll do a chapter on Luther and the Jews, because it's an interesting way of getting students to think about historiographical problems. And I, I, I would look Luther and the Jews up online. Luther and the Jews, well, it was reprinted, of course, in Nazi Germany. It becomes basic fodder in Nazi German propaganda. And many of the websites where you'll find it reprinted today are white supremacist websites. And I don't mean white supremacy in the rather amorphous way that it's come to be used. I mean Ku Klux Klan kind of sites. Uh, 
many of which also link to churches and denominations, which is the really scary part of it. But Luther's writing on the Jews have certainly enjoyed a, also an invidious and hideous afterlife. Uh, how do I still justify uh, reading Luther for pleasure and profit? Well, he's not all like that. Um, I do remember standing at the foot of the pulpit in Eisleben, um, where he was both born and he was interesting enough to die. And the last sermon he preached there, typically in the 16th century, you'd preach a sermon, but then you may add a bit on at the end. It's like a news broadcast. It's how people got their view of the world. The last sermon he preaches ends with a tirade against the Jews. And I remember praying when I stood at the foot of this uh, pulpit, praying, Lord, I will never have the positive influence that Luther has had, but may the last sermon I preach bring you more honor than I think the last sermon he preached did. I remember reading somewhere where famous preachers were asked to name their favorite sermon. R.C. Sproul listed Luther's last sermon. I remember thinking, well, I hope it wasn't the appendix he was thinking about. <laughs> So, so that's how I, it would take me a couple of hours to do all that. But that's where I would go with that. Any more questions? Uh, no. Okay. No angry uh, Roman Catholics to... No? <laughs> okay. That's good. All right. Okay. Well, uh, here. Okay. Well, first, I'd like a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Truman. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Truman, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, by the way, don't forget Lutheran Student Fellowship meets regularly at 6.30 p.m. on Sunday evenings in Ketrec. We're always happy to have more students join us. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. It was really an honor to have this event for Lutheran Student Fellowship.